about making sure that image bearers had dignity. The passage that we'll look at, there are a number of passages we could, but the passage that we'll look at in specific is a familiar passage to us all, I think, um, one that we go to, and when we go to it, we see it from the perspective or have, have seen it from the perspective of this passage is talking about a woman whose sin is exposed by Jesus, and then she comes in contact with the redeeming work of Jesus or the, or the, or the transformative work of Jesus, and her life is changed, and this sinful woman becomes a holy woman. John chapter 4. Well, I'd like to take us to that passage today, but I'd like to submit to you that this is also a passage about justice, where what we see is Jesus exposing the sin of a woman is actually Jesus exposing the ways in which this woman was treated unjustly. Um, and so I'm going to invite you to, to go on this journey with me as we talk about dignity, justice, and the Spirit. I know that the light is up here, um, but if I move down a little closer, will I still get some, enough light on me that you can see? Because I feel quite distant from you. I'm going to grab my tea and come down here. Can you see me? I can see you. So, thank you. Let's, let's begin. On January, uh, July, July 17, 2020, I think one of the, uh, the world lost a giant of a man who, when they lost the late congressman and civil rights activist, John Lewis. He died of pancreatic cancer. USA Today published uh, an article containing several of his many uh, memorable and meaningful quotes. One of them was something that he tweeted in June of 2018. Here's what the quote said. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day. Our struggle is not the struggle of a week or a month or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Now, I'm going to continue on with the rest of that quote, but before I do that, I think it's important for us to know that when we talk about John Lewis, all of what we hear about is John Lewis, the center, senator and the civil rights activist. Little of what we hear about is John Lewis, the follower of Christ, man of great faith whose justice was motivated by his love for Christ. It was John Lewis who was on that bridge in Selma with MLK who ended up getting his skull cracked. John Lewis was a follower of Jesus. And so when he's talking about this, he's also talking about the end. And basically what he's saying is, in this world, there will always be issues of injustice that need to be addressed. So when we talk about doing this for a lifetime, what he's saying is, as long as we live, there will be work to do when it comes to justice. But the day is coming when we will sit at that table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all of these things will be put to an end, and all of the wrongs will be made right. This is a struggle of, the life, of a lifetime. So let me just say here before we continue on, when it comes to followers of Jesus getting involved in issues of justice, if you're looking at it as a short fix, this is not the place for you. Sometimes you hear people say, in, and particularly, I would say, in the church, why do we keep having to have this conversation? We will continue to have to have this conversation. 
The conversation may look different. The conversation may be about different things. But as long as there is injustice, the church will be called to do justice. And so the conversation will continue. And as a result of the conversation, the actions of doing justice should result. I'll just say should result because sometimes we have the conversation and we don't do anything. And I think the day has come when the world is looking at the church and saying, I'm tired of your talk. Kind of sounds a little bit like what God was saying to Israel (laughs) in Isaiah 28, 58. I, I'm tired of your talk. You know, don't tell me about how much you fast. I want you to do justice. This is the work of a lifetime. Lewis continues on, and, and this is my favorite part. He said this, never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. Let me say that again. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. That is quite a contrast to everything we've always been taught, which is stay out of trouble. Avoid trouble at any cost. Don't find yourself in places where you can get into trouble. That sounds like something I would say to my kids when we we had small kids. I'd always say to them, listen, there are always going to be people at school who want to engage you in a fight. Do everything you can to avoid trouble. And I would say to them, if you happen to get into a fight, listen, you're going to have to defend yourself. Make sure you didn't start that fight. You know, don't start it. <laughs> I didn't say it. I didn't say it, but that's what was it. You know, don't start it. You got to finish it, but don't start it. Um, But we we teach people all the time, don't get in trouble. And yet, if you're going to do the work of justice, there may be times when you find yourself in trouble. Because good trouble may be messy trouble, (laughs) but the results of that trouble are for the good. We've been taught to stay away from it, never, but if you need to, get in good trouble necessary trouble. I find it interesting that Jesus began his ministry after 40 days in the wilderness, uh, 40 days and 40 nights being tempted by the devil, uh, 40 days and 40 nights of no food or water. Uh, He comes out of 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 the wilderness and emerges into the temple, and the first thing he does is make a statement that gets him in trouble. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to an attendant, and sat down. When we see those words, we say, Jesus said the statement, dropped the mic, and he was done. But actually, what they would have understood is the rabbi has made the statement, he sat down, and now we're about to get started. Now we're about to get started. And he started. (laughs) The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. I'd like to suggest to you or submit to you this morning that the work of justice is the compelling, calling, and carrying work of the Spirit. The work of justice is the compelling, calling, and carrying work of the Spirit. Let's flesh this out through John chapter 4. I'm not going to read the passage. I think we're all familiar with the passage, but I will refer to it on a number, in a number of ways. Um, I, I submit to you that there is something here for us to learn about this comparing, compelling, caring, calling work of the Spirit when it comes to justice. Jesus was leaving Judea. He was on his way to Galilee, and the text describes his, this, his route in this manner. 
and he had to pass through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. Anybody who knows anything about the way that Jews and Samaritans interacted or didn't interact uh, knows that John might as well have said, and Jesus decided to go make some noise and get him and his disciples in some more trouble. They were already in trouble. He had just left the temple with trouble. Uh, The Pharisees were after him. They didn't like his teaching. They didn't like his ministry. They didn't like the following that he was quickly developing. And knowing the attitude of the day about Samaritans and Jews and knowing he was already being characterized as a radical because of his teaching and his ministry style, Jesus would have been wise to play it safe and follow the rules, be compliant, and do what others would have done by taking a different route to get to Galilee totally avoiding Samaria altogether. After all, he didn't have to pass through Samaria. There was at least one route he could have taken, probably more, but one significant route he could have taken that would have taken him around Samaria. That's what Jews did. They would rather have taken a dangerous route that would have put their life at risk around Samaria than pass through Samaria. It was so bad that if the wind was blowing from a Samaritan in the way of a Jewish person, the Jewish person would have considered themselves unclean because the wind would have brought the fragrance or the smell, in in how they would have said it, of a Samaritan onto them. That's how badly Jews did not want to go through Samaria. But it says that he had to go through Samaria. And some commentators would have us think that he had to pass through Samaria because the Pharisees were after him, and it was his quickest way to get to escape the Samaritans. But I'd like to remind you that Jesus, being fully God, when he came to earth, was fully human, and in the words of A.W. Tozer, would have submitted himself to the Spirit and moved in the way that he did in his spirit-anointed humanity. If that's the case, then Jesus going through Samaria would have been this way. He had to pass through Samaria because Holy Spirit was leading him there. This was a spirit-appointed trip a spirit-appointed route, and Jesus never said no to the Spirit. If that is the case, then I would like to submit to you that when we're talking about worship, I'm talking about justice, when we're talking about doing justice and loving mercy and walking humbly with our God, then the Holy Spirit will most likely take you into arenas that others work hard to avoid. Holy Spirit will take you into arenas that others work hard to avoid. Four years ago now, it's hard to believe it's been four years already, when I took this role, I was elected to this position. We were living in Westchester County, New York, one of the wealthiest counties in the United States. Probably at the time, it's like the fifth wealthiest county in the United States. That's how much money is there. Martha Stewart lives there. Uh, Chevy Chase lives there. Richard Gere lives there. I could go on with all the people who live in Westchester County, in Bedford. And I was was the pastor at Bedford Hills, at the Alliance Church in Bedford Hills, right there. Uh, But I really enjoyed being there, and so we thought, yeah, we can you know, we can make it work. An hour and 20 minutes to the district office is not that far. I'll be okay. About three months in, we realized that I don't want to drive an hour and 20 minutes yeah. one way every day. And we decided to move. I have always, I grew up on Long Island in New York. Uh, yeah, you know about Long Island, right? But I've always wanted to live in one of the boroughs. And I won't mention the borough that we decided to move to, But I found it interesting that when I began to share that we were moving to the city, and in particular to this borough, the things that people said. 
And it really shocked me who said these things. Oh, you're moving there. Yeah, you know, the, the inflection <laughs> and the look. Oh, you're moving there. Huh. Do you have family there? I mean, you don't have to be near. No, I don't have family there. Hmm. Does your wife have family there? No, my wife did grow up in one of the boroughs. She grew up in Manhattan. She grew up in Harlem, but, you know, did, you, you want to live there? Everything about what was being said is, we avoid being there. Or the other thing was, oh, yeah, I used to live in the Bronx. I just told you the borough. <laughs> okay, that was not my intention, but I used to live in the Bronx. And then the question would come, what part of the Bronx? It was interesting. Don't you want to avoid being there? And yet we had, we were only there for two years before the district bought a parsonage and then we moved to Jersey. <laughs> and now I'm talking like people were talking to me, you know? There are places that we're told we need to avoid. Often, Holy Spirit will lead us to those places because those are the places that he wants to do some work. Holy Spirit will lead you to arenas that others work hard to avoid. Jews worked hard to avoid Samaria. But it says he had to go to Samaria. And, and when he got there, as he was passing through, he stopped for a bit because he was a little tired and wanted to sit down and rest and get something to drink. And it says that a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Midday. Hold on to that, because it's the hottest time. Who's going to draw water midday? But as she comes, it says that they began to talk about how wrong it was for a Jewish man to be talking to a Samaritan, especially a Samaritan woman. Conversation continued, and they began to talk about the difference between the water she was used to and the living water that he wanted to provide for her. They began to talk about the husbands she's had and the man that she was currently with, which wasn't her husband. They began to talk about the place of worship versus the posture of worship. They began to talk about the waiting for Messiah and the revelation of the Christ. They began to talk about how people kept away from God were now seeing and believing in God, and, and they, they, were, they were seeing him in the flesh. Here's what I find interesting about all of the conversation that they had that day. She was at the well at midday which means she was trying to avoid the crowd. There was a reason behind it. She's probably not intending to see anyone at all, wants to do what she needs to do quickly and get out of there. Uh, chances are she's not had a conversation with others in a long time. She probably hasn't had a conversation with others in years. That means that it's been a long time since anyone has heard her voice, Anyone has uh, 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 um, acknowledged her story? And up to this point, her story has been filled with presumption and resulted in shame. She's avoiding the crowd because people were assuming things about her. She's avoiding the crowd because when she went there to this place that should have been a place of fellowship for women, it was a place where she walked away feeling broken and hurt because she probably heard rumors about her at the well. Um, the fact that she kept talking to this Jewish man means that she had a lot to say and no one with whom she could have said it. And yet Jesus listened and Jesus asked questions and Jesus made statements that engaged conversation. And rather than running away from the conversation, she kept being drawn into the conversation. Here's what I conclude. The work of justice is a compelling, calling, and caring work of the Spirit that not only takes you to arenas that others would work hard to avoid, it also gives you ears to hear those who are not used to being engaged. It gives you ears to hear those who are not used to being engaged. Jesus did talking. 
But I'd also submit to you that he did a lot of listening. And he did a lot of observing that day. And something about the way he engaged her kept her talking rather than running away. The other thing that I would say is um, Jesus didn't make any assumptions. I think this woman was used to a lot of assumptions being made about her. And she got so hurt and so discouraged and so tired of the assumptions that she stopped going to the well. We don't make assumptions, do we? We see a person who is dirty and their clothes are all uh, messed up and they smell a little bit. Hair may be a little wrangled. And the first thing we say is if they get off those drugs, they'd be all right. Not knowing that they look that way because they lost their place to live. They don't make enough to get, another, uh, get more. Uh, and they're just trying to exist. But we don't listen. We assume. We see kids who are not coming to school on a regular basis, and we assume the parents don't care, not realizing they don't have enough for transportation. The car that they do have is raggedy and broke down. Public transportation doesn't come in their area of town, and they're struggling to try and just, just to get to work. And so they may miss getting their kids to school a couple of days. We see a woman with kids by herself, and we assume that she is a single mom with a deadbeat dad not doing anything, not ever realizing that they're, while they may not be together, they're actually co-parenting. And dad is working two or three jobs to make sure that this mom has the resources to make sure that that mom is taking care of the kids that are his too. And we don't even see that dad comes over and spends the night in this home, even though they're not together, so mom can go to her night job in order to take care of those kids. But we write them off as dead beat, not ever knowing the story a lot of assumptions. His name was Eddie. I was the campus pastor at Nyack College. I would take students downtown to Nyack and would uh, do some mentoring at Starbucks. Uh, everything happens at Starbucks. And every time I'd go, <laughs> yeah, and every time I'd go into Starbucks, I'd run into Eddie. And this is what Eddie would do, kind of nervously shaking, coming up, hey, 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 you got a dollar? And I finally would start giving Eddie a dollar, and he'd say, I I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to give it back to you. And this would go on. It went on for quite a while. And then Eddie started having little conversations with me, and I could tell something was off, but I wasn't sure what it was. But he didn't engage in the conversation. I tried to engage him back. Well, for a few weeks, I went into Starbucks, and Eddie wasn't there. And I finally just asked the person behind the counter, hey, what's going on with Eddie? Have you, have you seen him? And the person said, oh, him. We said to him he couldn't come in here anymore. He was a nuisance. The customers were upset with him, and he was causing us trouble. So we told him he wasn't allowed in here. And I didn't see him. And it grieved me. I'm like, what trouble is he causing? A couple of weeks went by, and I'm coming out of Starbucks, and there on the corner was Eddie. And I walked up to him, and I said, hey, Eddie, how you doing? You need a dollar? And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm okay. And I encountered a different Eddie. I said, Eddie, what's, I haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? And he said, Oh, I'm good. I'm on my medication. I'm hoping that I have enough money so that when my medication runs out, I can get some more. And he was schizophrenic. And nobody had listened to him. 
the work of justice gives you ears to hear those who are not used to being heard or engaged. This goes on. And this woman says, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus says, go call your husband and come here, wanting to be socially and, and culturally sensitive. Like, he's having this conversation with this woman. Look, I, this, this is, you know, I'm good having this conversation, but I want to make sure that you feel okay here. Go call your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right. You've had five husbands. And the one that you're with, is not your husband. What you said is correct. Here is our assumption. Jesus has hacked into her Facebook account. Or he's, you know, gone into her DMs and Instagram. He's seen all of her sins. And now he was just waiting for the opportunity to tell her what she did wrong. I'd like to submit something different to you. Here's a woman in a culture and in a day where she had no rights, she had no voice, she had no resources, she had no say, there was nothing that she could do. And here are five men. She couldn't write a writ of divorce herself. She was not allowed. She couldn't divorce the men, but they could divorce her. So let's look at this. Man number one uses, abuses, is done with her, wants to move on to another woman. So he writes a writ of divorce. Man number two comes along. What is she to do? She has no way of taking care of herself any other way. And all of a sudden, he looks at her, catches an eye for her, and says, I'll marry her. But then he uses and abuses and has his way with her, gets tired of her. He wants to move on to another woman, writes a writ of divorce. Man number three, and you can see the progression. Now we're at man number six. He's not even going to commit to her. But he's still going to use her. He's still going to abuse her. And he's still going to ruin her reputation. He's not being blamed. She is. Here's what I'd like to submit to you. That when Jesus said to this woman, you've had five husbands, and the one that you're with right now is not your husband, you have said correctly, something deep in her soul happened. And it was in a sense of shame because she continued the conversation. In fact, she moved closer to the conversation. I think when Jesus said that, first of all, it was a word of Knowledge, Holy Spirit at work here, the gifts at work here, word of knowledge. But I think for her, it was a transformative moment, a moment that says, I've been seen. I've been noticed. I've been heard. And here is this Jewish man who doesn't want anything from me. Here's this man who's not going to abuse me. I don't know where he came from, but I've never experienced this before. And this woman who has come to the well, always experiencing hurt, has now come to the well, and now she's experiencing healing. Instead of this man using me, something tells me this man wants to cover me. Something else that I want us to see here that is, we could quickly run by it, but I think it's important. When they come to Samaria, Jesus sends his disciples to go get lunch. We can quickly just run by that. Of course they're going to want lunch. They're going to get hungry. 
But remember, we started this by saying Jews did not go to Samaria. They went around Samaria. They had nothing to do with Samaria. But wherever Jews went, they spent their money. If I'm not going through Samaria, that means the resources that I have are not being invested in Samaria. That means the economy of Samaria is being effective. It's being affected in a negative way. That means that Samaritans have to scrimp and scrape and scrap and do whatever they have to do to try and get by because there's no one investing in the community. But Jesus says to his disciples, go buy lunch. If they're passing through Samaria, where are they going to buy lunch from? A place in Samaria. Where are they going to spend their money? In Samaria. I'd like to submit to you that Jesus saw the economic state that was left for the Samaritans. And without saying, I'm going to do justice to the economy, he just simply said to his disciples, go buy lunch. I don't know that the disciples like that. Buy lunch here. I don't know anything about this food. You know these people. They're probably dirty. They're not clean. I mean, all kinds of conversations could have been going on with the disciples. How do I know that? Because when they came back with the lunch, they see Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, and while they didn't have the guts to say anything to him, they certainly had a conversation around them about themselves. Does he know what he's doing? <laughs> Jesus, you have lost your mind talking to that woman. I'm so glad nobody else is here. I don't know how we'd explain this one. I know we're following you. Sometimes you do some of the stupidest things, and we just have... That's the conversation that's going on. And now we got this stinky food that we had to buy that while he might find it good, I'm not going to eat it because I know who cooked it. But for one day, the economy of Samaria was different. And for one day, at least this day that we saw, because I think Jesus started something when he did this. The economy of Samaria was recovered. And for one day, somebody was building into the city. Here's what I want to tell you about the work of justice. It is a spirit-empowered work that moves you to action for those without advocates. Moves you to action for those without advocates. Jesus advocated not only for this woman, he advocated for Samaria that day. They all felt it. <laughs> they all felt it. And this is how we know they all felt it. The conversa conversation continues. First of all, let me uh, go, go back to something that I said in the um, the message yesterday, I want to bring this back up. Dr. Cornell West says this, tenderness is what love looks like in private. Justice is what love looks like in public. It's one thing to sit where we sit and have our hearts break for what we see and have our hearts break for the ills of society. It's another thing to say, I'm not just going to sit here and let my heart break. I'm going to advocate for those who don't have advocates. I'm going to be the voice for those who are voiceless. I'm going to make sure those who are not cared for are cared for. And if I am the only one right now, then at least I am the one who will start something and will start a change. Because quite often, people will ask you why. Why are you doing that? Oh, you want to know why I'm doing that? Well, let me tell you. Statistics say blah, 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 blah. Why, why am I doing that? Let me tell you the story of someone, and Jesus would have had a story to tell. Let me tell you the story of this woman. Let me tell you how her five husbands treated her. Let me tell you how the man that she's with right now is using and abusing her, won't even marry her, won't even give her a decent name, won't even cover her, because that's the way the society was. 
and he wouldn't do it. Jesus had a story to tell. Let me tell you what my disciples found when I sent them into town. They found restaurants in ruins. <laughs> they had people barely existing. They found the streets that were dirty. And yes, I said, buy food there because that made us aware. I imagine those were the kind of conversations Jesus was having. It wasn't just about tenderness of heart. It was like, I'm going to be an advocate. If I say, tell people to love God and love your neighbor, I'm going to show them what it looks like to love your neighbor. God calls us to advocate for those without voices. And as this conversation goes on, I think she shifted the conversation to worship because she had never met such tenderness, and she didn't know what to do with it. I see you are a prophet. I didn't expose my mail to you, but you read something, and you didn't judge me. Let's talk about worship. And they have the conversation that leads to him saying, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And she says, I know Messiah is coming. <laughs> when he comes, he will tell us all things. And then revelation. I who you speak of, I am he. Jesus will always reveal himself. I'm going to go here a little earlier, but let me go here now. I think we so bifurcate the gospel that we forget that sometimes it's through the work of justice that Jesus reveals himself. The gospel was never to be bifurcated. There's no, as I read scripture, there is no such thing as the gospel of salvation and social justice. It is the holistic gospel the holistic gospel, which means that we are to give Jesus and we are to live Jesus. He says this to her, I'm the, I'm the who you speak, I'm the one who you speak of. She goes into town, gets everybody. Remember, this is the woman who would go to the well in the middle of the day so she didn't talk to anyone. But now she's going to town. And what she's saying, come see a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Maybe what she means is he's told me everything that's ever been done to me. Someone has described intimacy this word in this way, intimacy, into me you see. Jesus saw into her that day. Everything. Could this be the Christ? And then what happens? All the people start coming, and they start looking. Here's the woman who avoided us. Here's the woman we assumed things about. Here's the woman we talked about. And now she's coming and telling us we need to go, okay, something's happened to her. Let's go see what she's talking about. And then eventually they come to her and say, you know what? We don't believe because you said it anymore. We believe because we've seen and we've heard we believe because something has changed. You see what I mean? This is not a bifurcation of the gospel. This is a holistic view of the gospel. It's our founder, A.B. Simpson, who said this. He wanted to take the whole gospel to the whole world. What am I trying to say here? Friends, finally, the work of justice is the compelling, calling, and carrying work of the Spirit that reveals a just Savior who cares about a just soul and a just society. A just savior who cares about a just soul and a just society. Justice is always vertical and horizontal. Vertical and horizontal. It is always that way. This same Jesus that saved her soul is the same Jesus that strengthened her self-worth. The same Jesus that delivered her from the depths of hell is the same Jesus that treated her with dignity. The same Jesus that revealed himself as Christ is the same Jesus who by his very presence in Samaria called out the racism and the societal shame that had been put on her 
and others in Samaria. The same Jesus that gave her living water is the same Jesus that defied the laws of society just so that she would know that she had been seen and heard. The same Jesus that rescued her friends from the kingdom of darkness is the same Jesus that, be, that bettered their town by building into their economic stability. The same Jesus that, that met the deep longing of this woman's life to encounter the Christ is the same Jesus that gave beauty for ashes and made anointed this woman to be, catch this, an evangelist. Not only this woman, this Samaritan woman, this outcast, this one who was treated as other has now been anointed as an evangelist. And a whole community now is following Jesus. And not only is the whole community following Jesus, the earthly dwelling of this community has now been transformed by Jesus. It's not an either or. It's a both and. It's a both and. He didn't separate the gospel that transforms from the soul from the gospel that uh, reforms uh, humanity because he cares about a just soul and a just society. Hey, friends, you, let me, if I can, remind you uh, how evangelicals are described. And when they first started talking about evangelicals, there were four tenets of evangelicalism. The first one, conversionism. Salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only truth. Jesus is the only life. Second, Biblicism. We hold to the Bible as the inerrant word of God, and it is our only rule for faith and practice. Third, crucicentrism. The cross is central. All of the work of salvation was accomplished on the cross. Uh, what's that book by A.W. Pink, Redemption Accomplished and Applied? That's what we're talking about when we say crucicentrism. And here's the one that is there, but we seem to forget activism. Activism is about evangelism and social reform. These, in the early days of evangelicalism, were the four tenets of evangelical. In the early days of evangelicalism, there was no bifurcation of salvation and social reform. We have somehow come to a place where we see the gospel <laughs> and the social gospel. And we say, we're not going to get involved in social reform because that's just the social gospel. But I'd like to submit to you that if the church is not present in these spaces, then at best what we're giving people is a humanitarian effort. It's only when we see the church present and bringing the just Savior who cares about a just soul and a just society. And people are seeing the holistic gospel at work. That true change and reform can happen. That true transformation can happen. That true justice can take place. Because when the church is present, then society gets biblical justice. Biblical justice. A friend of mine in, in Brooklyn puts it this way. Justice is not political. It's biblical. Justice is not political. It's biblical. And he and his congregation are out on the streets of Brooklyn. And when they go out on the streets of Brooklyn, they're wearing shirts that say that. Justice is not political. It's biblical. Somehow we've come to a place where uh, we're going to preach the gospel. And when we talk about the social stuff, that's all politics. 
and we leave that away. I'd like to submit to you that it's become politics because the church isn't present. The church is not present. But I'd also like to submit to you that when God's church rises up and leads the way in justice, maybe things can turn around and then we see both political parties or whoever it is saying, hey, we've been doing this and we're just making a mess of it. Somehow you, you're doing this and you're effective and you're transforming communities and lives are being changed and people are seeing a better way. What is it that you're doing? What is it that you know? Who is it that you know? And how can we come to know? Because I want to do what you're doing. When that happens, then we are fulfilling what our command is from Micah 6, 8, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Jesus had a lot to say about justice, but he said what he said by doing justice. And you might think, well, you know what, maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're CMA people. CMA people don't do that. I'd like to challenge you. Do you know our founding? <laughs> Because I think it was an, uh, Albert Benjamin Sisson who was working at a church in New York City, a very prestigious church, where if you were to look at today what he was making then, he was making six figures. He was doing quite well. And Italian immigrants were coming into the docks of New York. And he not only cared about them coming to meet Jesus, he cared about the plight of their physical state. And he wanted to make sure that they were being cared for physically also. And so his ministry from that church in New York City, uh, he would meet with these Italian immigrants and he would make sure their families were cared for and that they had food to eat and, uh, and they had clothes on their back. And then he would minister to them and he would say, oh, let me tell you about this savior that I know. And as people came to know Jesus, he went back to his church board and said, hey, I've got all these new converts. They want to be baptized. And they want to be a part of the church. And they all cheered. No, they didn't. <laughs> but they said, if I can translate, not in here, not on this pew. I don't care what they do, but my money bought this pew. They're not taking my seat. You better find another place for them. And I'm still looking for the quote. I've heard it several times, and I want to make sure that I can find it. But the quote is, Simpson said something to this effect. If this is what it means to be a respectable Christian, I'm out here. I'm out. That's why Simpson left his church. It was over an issue of justice. It is true that he had a passion and a calling to take the whole gospel to the whole world. That's why we are the Christian and Missionary Alliance today. That is a part of our heritage. But the other part of our heritage is we, though he never intended to found a denomination, part of how we were founded was because Simpson left over an issue of injustice. And that's why we now are a denomination, a ministry, a movement that looks at the gospel holistically. And we preach Christ as Savior, sanctifier, healer, and coming king. And we also continue to do the work of justice as our founder did because he saw the gospel holistically. The same Simpson that wrote, Jesus only is our message, Jesus all our things shall be, we will lift up Jesus ever, Jesus only will we see, is the same Simpson that said to unwed mothers, you should not be on your own, I'm going to make a home for you. And he started homes for unwed mothers. The same Simpson that wrote yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name is the same Simpson who said, I not only want to train people who want to go and be carriers of the gospel to the ends of the earth. I want to make sure that those who are marginalized and couldn't get a good education get an education. He not only wanted to start the Missionary Training Institute because of training missionaries, he wanted to make sure that people had access to education. 
the same Simpson that wrote these words. Oh, Christ, my Lord and King, this is the prayer I bring. This is the song I sing. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, is the same Simpson that said to people, you need healing, physical healing, but you may also need some emotional respite. And he started healing homes, baraka houses. Do you see what I'm saying, friends? We are a movement that has seen the gospel holistically from day one. We are a movement that from day one has done justice and loved mercy and walked humbly with our God. I will say that the thing that God has called us to do and the way he's called us to be, uh, to be seeing the gospel holistically is now being threatened by what's going on in society. As the church becomes more polarized and more politicized, we lose our call. We lose our call. May it never be. May it never be. Because society needs a movement, a gospel movement that says we are going to see the gospel holistically. We are going to take the gospel, whole gospel to the whole world. And I'm going to just put this out here. We understand this in other countries. We live this out in other countries. When will we realize that what we do in other countries, God's calling us to also do here? In all things, we preach Jesus as our Savior, our sanctifier, our healer, and coming, thing, coming king. And in all things, we do justice, love mercy, walk humbly, with our God. Now, this is not a formulaic thing, but I would might like to suggest to you uh, four L's, if you will, that I think become helpful. Number one is listening. Jesus did a lot of listening as he's in interacting with this Samaritan woman. Well, how do I begin to listen? Simple four words. Tell me your story. We do that when we want to hear how far away from Jesus someone is. I think the same thing applies. We want to hear what it is that this person's world needs. Listen. And as you move into listening, you're going to hear some things that break your heart. So the second L is this, lament. I didn't see Jesus lamenting. Actually, I think he did lament. I think that whole comment about, oh, you've had five husbands, and the one that you're with right now is not your husband. You've said it well. I think he said it more like that. We interpret it as, mm, you had five husbands. The one, you're not, the one you're with now, you said it. I'm glad you told the truth. I'm glad you confessed. <laughs> That's how we look at it. But I think Jesus said it with sadness and sorrow in his voice because he knew what this woman's life must have been like. And though he may not have been weeping and wailing, he was lamenting with her. We must learn to lament with the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized and the disenfranchised. Not pity the poor, <laughs> but lament with the poor. Because that builds trust. And after we've listened to this story and we've lamented, maybe the next thing we want to do is learn. That's where the asking questions comes in. So what do you need? What does your community need? Not, I know what you need, let me fix it. But learning. And quite often, just be prepared. 
that when you say, what do you need, you might get a bit of a caustic answer or approach. Oh, you want to know what I need? Take out a pad and paper. You got a pencil? I'm going to tell you what I need. Blah, 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 blah. Can you meet those needs? They're so used to being pushed aside that they really want to see, and you're going to put your money where your mouth is. And we have to give an honest answer. Can you meet those needs? I can't meet all those needs. But these I can. <laughs> well, come on. I'll take you down to Hattie's house. I'm going to tell you what, what Hattie needs. Come over to Bob's house. I'm going to show you what Bob needs. And that's how the relationship begins. It's only then that we can really launch into doing justice. I am very much a fan of the kind of come in and drop things that are needed in the immediacy. So hear, hear me on this. I am not saying those kinds of um, uh, resources are not good. But if justice is something that we're in for the long haul, we don't know what the long haul needs unless we're listening, lamenting, learning before we launch. Go into arenas that others work hard to avoid. Give, ear to, give ears to hear those who are not used to being heard or engaged. Get moved into action for those without advocates. Reveal a just savior who cares about a just soul and a just society. Uh, work of justice is compelling, calling, carrying work of the spirit. That's not an overnight fix. It's the work of a lifetime. And I would say this, in the work of justice, we need to hold on to the words of Paul to the church at Galatia, and be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap a harvest if you faint not. Five minutes and I get to fill my belly with food. Uh, any questions or any comments? Let me also say this, we, you won't do everything perfectly. I can't tell you how many times I thought, I got this, and later on I've had to apologize. What people want is transparency. They're not asking for perfection. They want transparency, and they want relationship. That's it, presence. Presence is more powerful than anything you could give because it's out of that presence, uh, it's birth, what, what it is that you know what, what needs to be given. Mm -hmm. Incarnational ministry, the word became flesh. Please, friends, let us not abdicate our responsibility as God's people to do justice. Let us not hand this off to a place or to people who at best will do a humanitarian thing and really find people who are now projects and pictures for someone else's agenda. Let us be the church that takes the lead and does it because we serve a just savior who cares about a just soul and a just society. It is a joy and an honor and a privilege to be with you these days. Monty, I am so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to our time together this evening um, and uh, the continued partnership that we're trying to develop between Alliance Northwest and the Metropolitan District. Thank you so much.